Bombs over Syria. Uh oh. Gold. Uh oh. Bitcoin. Uh oh. Major U.S. indices. Uh oh. A lot to get to this week. I see a lot of worried faces. I'm getting the worried emails. I love it all. I am Gerardo Del Real, along with my co-host, Mr. Nick Hodge. This is episode 106 of Bizarro World. We're going to talk Trump tax returns, gold, Bitcoin, copper rates, Capitol Police, MDB having Washington Post journalists killed, and Biden says, don't even worry about it. I got you. A lot to get to, but first and foremost, Mr. Hodge, how are you today, sir? Well, that was a heck of an intro, Gerardo. It was like a Nelly song in the, in the beginning. Uh-oh, it took me back. It took me back like 20 years. And uh, Also today, I tried to stick my finger in my mouth for the first time while I was wearing a mask and felt like an asshole out in public, so... Um, <laughs> I got that going for me. How's did, it going? Did, did, you, did, did you feel like a literal asshole or just was that metaphorical? <laughs> it was metaphorical. I felt like a jerk. I am well, Nick. Um, the song I was referencing was actually an outcast song. Bombs over Baghdad. Da, 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 da. Anyhow, listen, um, let's get right to it. Let's start with the markets and then we'll talk about, you know, the not so peaceful intro to the Biden um, administration, whether we agree or disagree on the reasons why he's doing it. The bottom line is uh, Syria did get bombed here the past couple of days, and, and, and there's a lot brewing in the Middle East that could prove to be consequential to the markets here in the near term. So we'll get into that. But look, everybody is looking at gold and emailing me. We dropped 37 bucks today, down 2% today on a day, you know, where the dollar was up 0.7%. But you know, seventeen thirty-three. You got, you got, got, got some, got some uh, worried uh, Nellies out there. Silver down to twenty-six fifty-eight. You know, Bitcoin. The last I checked was flirting with forty-seven thousand. Um, thoughts, Nick? Are you worried? What are you doing? I think I said this week that I'm not scared yet I'm, uh, <laughs> about anything really, and I'm still not scared. Um, about the uh, S and P or the gold price, you got a big candle, like you said, on the uh, gold price there today. But a lot of support there, and the or wherever you want to call it, low seventeen uh, hundreds, right? So seventeen uh, hundreds. No, I think you're just um, getting corrections and and pullbacks uh, in a bull market. I think that. Uh, bond rates are the strongest that they've been in a long time. And you and I have been talking about it for weeks, but uh, that narrative, the, the, the increasing bond yield narrative is now gaining a bit of steam. And um, a couple of specific stocks broke. Tesla had a heck of a week, didn't it? Um, mm. uh, and so that scared a lot of people. Those are That's like a widely owned name. And so when, when that happens, right, is like you were saying the other week, is Elon Musk going to die? Is Elon Musk going to die? The death you know, of Elon. <laughs> so many people own that stock that it gets a lot of uh, people worried and it gets a lot of people clicking. And so it gets a lot of people talking about it. But um no, I'm not too scared. And um, I guess I should mention volatility hasn't uh, perked up all that much either. Nope. Um, and so um, what would Keith McCullough say that would indicate to you that this would be an episodic and non-trending uh, case of uh, sell-off? Which is technical for, it's noise, folks. It's noise. Look at a one-year, two-year, three-year chart of gold or silver or Bitcoin or the Dow, or the NASDAQ, or the S&P. I actually like the pullbacks. The pullbacks are healthy, healthy, necessary. Shake some of the weaker hands out of there. Um, you know, it, it is interesting to note that the juniors, the copper juniors, and of course this is due in fact to, to or due in part to copper holding up very, very well this week, right? It hit a high of 433 a pound, closed today at 419. But, you know, a lot of the better juniors, some that we highlighted here, we gave people their money's worth, Nick, um, free podcast and all, they've, they've had good runs. Uh, Regulus today closed at 128 Canadian. You know, it's uh, a month ago, this thing was sitting there at 85 cents when we were telling you you should be looking at it and uh, and, and and buying it. And, and there's several other names that, um, you know, have held up well. Chicana held up well this week. 
Um, closed at 58 cents, 57 cents, had a high of 63 cents this week. So look, I, I, I think the pullback's healthy. I love the emails. Um, keep them coming. I, I, I like responding to them and then and, and, and getting a feel for the pulse of, of subscribers and readers and followers. And so to answer everyone's question, healthy pullback, still clearly in a precious metals bull market. Um, I think the equities are telling you as much, but there are some incredible bargains in the gold space that are emerging. I would highlight Moss and Gold as one that had a pretty tough month. You know, it was trading right around 36 cents Canadian. That's down to 26 cents as of the close today, today being Friday, of course. So um, Moss and Gold is an opportunity that I would absolutely look at. K2 Gold is another one. They were delayed a bit as they are awaiting approval for future drilling at the Mojave Gold Project. I really like that project. I would not hold it through the permitting phase, though that 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 may change. That may change. I like the team that's working on that. But look, as far as an exploration gold project, it's an excellent project run by an excellent team and a team that has the network to go out and diversify its project base by sourcing other projects, part of the discovery group. If you don't believe me, you go look at Eat Those Gold, go to their website and go look at their last 10 press releases. And um, that, that, that should give you some insight as to the network and deal-making ability that the Discovery Group possesses. So um, eat those gold, moss and gold, like both of those. Copper Juniors hanging in there, like that a lot. Um, undervalued copper play, if you're looking for one. Rock Ridge Resources, and that's all the freebies that you get today, everybody. I mean, I'll give you another one as a continuation of last week. I was talking about, I'm a chartist now, Gerardo. I don't know if you know. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> I was smarter? God damn it. I was talking about <laughs> Another Newmont notch in your week. cap, on your belt, another feather in your cap, Nick. And it was at $56. Do you remember Newmont was at $56? And what was I saying? It could go to $54 or $52. And then that would be like a really attractive buying opportunity, right? And yep. so... Um, if I'm looking at Newmont, follow the price of gold. It's sitting um, at the in the low 54s right now, so it's uh, peeled off two dollars from what I was saying last week. And you and I were talking earlier, or in a chat earlier, saying you know it's not gold's time yet, but it's 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 getting closer, right? And I can see it looking at this uh, Newmont chart, just the sentiment of the uh, sector in general. I mean, it wants to touch uh, the lows of like. Uh, well, shit, Gerardo, last summer before it took mm. off to, to record prices in in in, in August. Right? I was going to say so, then what happened, right? <clears throat> right. And so I'm watching keenly. And um, yeah, it's just very interesting because, you know, what's also interesting is that uh, Newmont's yielding like almost 4%, right? I'm watching the, looks like a bond. I'm watching the price tick lower and I'm watching just the yield tick higher. And I'm like, man, you can buy Newmont with... Uh, producing gold at, at 17 whatever $1,800 an ounce, a healthy balance sheet, 4%. And there's a lot to like there, right? And um, I guess one more, if we're just throwing out free names, is I've queued up Alamos a couple times recently, and I haven't been able to pull a trigger because I think that thing wants to touch below $7 before it turns back around. And so uh, a lot to like in Alamos. Uh, a lot to like in there uh, up around Island, and uh, a lot to like about it yielding uh, over one percent as well, uh, an attractive takeout target. I'll, 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 I'll roll the dice here and give you another name, folks, because it's just it's it's a gimme. This is easy money if you could just hold it when the market turns. Magna Gold. I can't believe I get to buy Magna Gold at the ninety-two oh, cent oh, no. level Canadian. It's got a market cap of eighty-two million and is likely. To make, let me do the math for you real quick, folks. 60,000 ounces on the low end is what I believe they will produce this year. Margins, I believe, will be approximately 800 bucks. That is 48 million in free cash flow this year that you can expect from Magna. And it's got a market cap of 82 million. It's got a silver portfolio, I believe, will be spun out to create a standalone silver company. It's what I am encouraging the company to do. Um, 
it's got exploration upside. It's got 3 million ounces in the, its resource base. That's growing quickly. It's drilling. It's got assays pending. If you are in the junior resource space and you like gold producers, explorers, developers, and you don't own Magna Gold, you probably should find another sector to speculate in. This one isn't for you if you don't like what you see in Magna Gold. Um, anyhow, that's my rant on Magna. Buy Magna Gold. Uh, I'm adding to my Magna position, full disclosure. I'm biased in everything I tell you or I wouldn't be saying it to you. Um, I always think it's funny when people say, oh, you know, I'm biased and you should be biased. You're saying it, right? That's exactly right. Eating your own cooking. Uh, a lot of people like that and um, more people should. More people should. Let's uh, <laughs> Let's pivot a little bit in my weekly Fuck Ted Cruz segment. Ted Cruz is in Florida this week. Freedom! Freedom! That's how he was rallying up the uh, the people at the conference down there. So here, meanwhile, President Biden is here in Texas, in Houston, surveying the damage, um, issuing disaster declarations. Uh, Ted Cruz seems to want to be anywhere where there is sunshine and anywhere where there are not constituents for him to speak with. It is extremely, extremely disappointing not personally, because I expect this behavior out of him. But I have to believe, even for the most ardent Ted Cruz supporters, they got to be a little bummed out and disappointed in their guy. Because, man, talk about bailing on your duties that you were fucking elected for. Um, so anyhow, that's my weekly segment of Fuck Ted Cruz. Let's get to Texas. Um, I talked about ERCOT, right? The Electric Reliability Council of Texas which is the agency that oversees the state's private power grid. Um, they have now confirmed what I told you last week, what I had read last week, um, that the power grid came within four minutes and 37 seconds of a collapse that would have meant an extended blackout lasting weeks and possibly months where 26 million, every single one of us Texans would have lost power we would have lost heat um and what was the cause of the uh rolling blackouts or the near grid failure there and i think we highlighted it a bit last week it wasn't just one event right um the bulk of our electricity of, of our of our power generation comes from natural gas wells that froze because they weren't properly winterized and i went over the numbers last week um a nuclear plant failed Wind turbines froze. Um, solar, you know, didn't behave the way it was supposed to. But let's be absolutely clear that the bulk of the energy that came offline was natural gas. And I think, you know, as as more and more Californians come to Texas, um, we're going to have to do, obviously, a much better job of winterizing. And, and as we winterize, we're also going to have to be cautious in how we do that. Because summers here, as everyone knows, get extremely hot. And so I, I, I hope it's a wake-up call for the people, the lawmakers, the people that run this energy grid. Unfortunately, for a lot of Texans, it was the opposite of a wake-up call. It was a good night call because people died as a result of the negligence. And, you know, I got a couple of emails. Uh, one gentleman wrote and, uh, you know, he was disappointed that I, I blamed the state of Texas. I'm not blaming the state of Texas. I'm blaming ERCOT. I'm blaming lawmakers that had reports from a decade ago that warned of this failure, that warned about increasing demand, that warned about the natural gas wells not being winterized properly. And I'm, I'm blaming anybody that had the ability to act on that and failed to do so. Those people deserve it. I'm not blaming the entire state of Texas. Um, but yeah, we're big on accountability here in Bizarro World. And I'm big on accountability here in this thing called life. So if you don't like that, sorry. Well, I, the reason I asked is because uh, we were talking last week about how it was turning into a partisan issue, right? With the um, left blaming uh, fossil fuel energy <laughs> and the right blaming the clean or green energy and we, we were saying that the failure was an all of the above failure and the solution is a all of the above approach. Um, and I happened to see my neighbor that afternoon and it was funny. We were talking about, you know, how crazy things were in Texas, whatever, just a shoot in the breeze. And, he, you know, 
a conservative guy, he immediately goes to the wind turbines, right? And so I just think it's funny how that, uh, you know, that narrative comes into and we st- and then we stick to that, right? Blinded by sort of like our political biases instead of uh, accepting the fact that um, the failure was a result of multiple things and the solution is a part of multiple things. And then I guess um, two things I wanted to mention or one thing I wanted to mention and one thing I wanted to ask you is... Um, I had a chance to watch the Bill Gates documentary on Netflix. You know, I don't watch much TV. And when I do, I talk about it. So uh, yeah. it's actually two years old from 2019. It's a three-part series. But the last part is about Terra Power and his approach to uh, climate change. He goes for big solutions, right? Like when he went for polio, he went for like total eradication. And when he goes for climate change, he goes for like the most bold, impactful solution. And he believes that to be um, nuclear. Uh, in some form. And so he was mm-hmm. back in the news this week is why I bring it up because I saw an article saying, um, you know, he was continues to believe that nuclear is a major part of the climate change solution. And of course, uh, increasingly, we're talking here about uh, virtual power plants, right? And so uh, I didn't know, Gerardo, but I learned in the past week that you have sort of a virtual power plant uh, going on at your home. And I wanted to... Uh, hear about it because you're able to uh, monitor it from a website and you're able to uh, see it in real time on your smartphone. And I gather it involves, um, uh, you know, knowing how much of your home is being powered by solar panels versus the grid, et cetera. And I, I was wondering if you could talk about it a little bit. No, absolutely. I, I, I and, and I'll share that story in just a bit. I want to be more specific as to your question. I, I pulled the numbers up from a piece I wrote earlier this week. So um, this is straight from the energy grid owner and operator between 60 and 70% of the power in Texas being natural gas. Um, the biggest failure was the failure of the gas system to perform. There definitely needs to be a, a, a all hands on deck approach. The governor, Governor Abbott, who, you know, again, forget the partisanship. I'm not a fan of either party. Um, I'm a fan of accountability. Um, you know, he's he's been at the forefront of a lot of good things and he's been on the wrong side of a lot of other things. And he's he's absolutely complicit in this and on the wrong side of this. But to his credit, he came out and faced his constituents and admitted as much and said, look, this is just unacceptable. It can't happen. We're going to figure out exactly how to how to how to make this work and 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 make it work correctly so this never happens again um so kudos to him for at least being accountable i respect that much i don't respect the six board members and the one candidate from ERCOT that uh resigned this past week they resigned before the damn investigation was even out and before the report was even issued and that no, was natural gas it was natural gas <laughs> not a damn i'm sorry What's that, Nick? I said it was natural gas, not a dam. It was. It was. <laughs> sorry, I was in upset mode. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, what'd you say? <laughs> um, so yeah, look again. We're big on accountability around here. Stay and face the music. Um, if you made a mistake, um, admit as much. Don't bail on people. People died. You already failed us once. At the very least, stick around and make the transition smooth and bring new people in that actually are able to make a positive change and contribution. Um, back to the back to uh, your, your your question. Um, look, I, I <laughs> the death of Elon, right? Elon's not dying, and neither are his products because his products are pretty damn good. I happen to have you know solar panels here at home, um, and 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 Tesla provides this power wall option that allows you to install the solar panels in your home, you immediately download the app and that app will track in real time exactly how much solar your solar panels are converting into energy, how much your home is consuming. Again, all this in real time. Um, And and then how much excess solar is being sold back to the energy grid. Um, Of course, when, when, when the home needs more power than what the panels are able to distribute, then it'll show you how much the grid is actually contributing to the home. And so, you know, every month on my utility bill, I'll get, you know, my, 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 my utility bill that shows me how much power the home used. And then it'll give me a credit for the amount that I sold back to the grid, all the excess power, right? And so 
Obviously, it's 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 more effective in the spring and summer here because it's sunnier. But the app is fantastic. I mean, I'll, I'll give it to Tesla. It'll tell me in real time every day, every week, every month, every year. I can go back, you know, the history of the system, how much the solar power offset my energy uh, usage. And it'll tell me, you know, exactly how many kilowatts per hour um, my home consumed. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful. It's actually been educational to me because it's, it's interesting. The, 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 some of the, some of the things that you don't associate with like a lot of power consumption, um, you know, running a blender is a small example of that. And just being able to turn things on and off and seeing in real time, how many more kilowatts, um, your, your home needs now, it has been pretty interesting to me. And, you know, the second product that offers the power walls neat for situations just like the one that we had last week. And so what the power wall does is you, you separate system that ties into the solar panels and it will store power for you and make it to where if the grid fails, depending on the size of your power wall, it will keep you running. And, you know, they sell systems that sure they may cost 50 or 60,000, but they'll keep you going for 15 to 20 days. And with stored energy in that. And so look at it as a solar energy generator, right? As opposed to the traditional kind. Um, and, you know, they have systems as cheap as seven, $8,000 that will keep you going overnight um, every day, as long as, you know, as, as long as the sun comes out. And so you can kind of depend, you can kind of decide on on your, your, your risk level and, and your comfort level, and then just scale out your Powerwall uh, backup system and and track all of it in real time. So, yeah, it's 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 why Elon's not dying. Is why he's not going away. It's why he's the richest guy in the world. Um, we can have a discussion about you know his overpromising and underdelivering, but his products thus far, you know, from the cars to the panels to the power walls, I, I have nothing but good good things to say about them. You're calling it a solar power generator, but the proper name is a is a virtual power plant and PPP. Um, you know, one of the ideas in the in the future, and in some cases, uh, to a certain extent now, is to tie them together, right? So uh, your home uh, outside of Austin has solar panels and uh, a battery and, um, you know, so do a couple of your neighbors. And so if your neighborhood goes out, you could potentially like share power in the future if you wanted to, instead of having to have... Uh, uh, centralized power plant. This is like a decentralized power plant in the same way that like, um, you know, cryptocurrencies are a decentralized currency to the centralized dollar. And it's a very real thing. Like I couldn't actually believe it. I was uh, scrolling in the news just yesterday and I saw that the Shell, like Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, the Shell, mm -hmm. uh, bought bought a, a virtual power plant company. And this isn't like a made up thing. The Bloomberg headline was Shell acquires, makes virtual power plant acquisition and acquired a company called Next Craftwork, um, which is operating a virtual power plant similar to what I just described uh, in Europe. And in Europe, they're doing so um, to the tune of like multi gigawatts. So to just mm. put it in context, like a, a nuclear power plant is like a gig, right? Like a thousand megawatts. And so... Um, if you're managing a virtual power plant that's two gigs, that's like uh, replacing the need for or having the ability to have the capacity of two uh, nuclear power plants. It's a very clean solution. Um, and it's definitely, I think, uh, part of the all of the above approach that I was mentioning. That's a solution to the grid problems we've been seeing here in the States. If only I knew a guy who knew of a company that could provide me with some quality exposure to these virtual power plants. It sounds like you uh, on a first name basis with Mr. Musk. <laughs> or Mr. Hodge, as some would call him. Listen, I've picked on Ted Cruz because he deserves to be picked on the past several weeks and years. And since I moved to Texas and actually before that, I disliked the guy. So let's pick on the other side a little bit. Andrew Cuomo is doing a great job this week for Asshole Politician of the Week. 
Um, you know, this guy won an Emmy, if I'm not mistaken, for his press conferences where he, you know, played the part of the caring, responsible, straight shooting New Yorker that told it like it was, right? That was the part that he was playing on TV during the COVID crisis, a part that he received a lot of praise for. Now it looks like he may be on the verge of no longer being governor and he may have earned himself a primary. There are multiple reports now, not Mm. only, not only that he lied about the amount of people that were dying in nursing homes. He hid that for months, failed to report thousands of deaths of nursing home patients who had been hospitalized with COVID-19. Not only did he do that, (laughs) he also allegedly, I didn't hear the call, but this is the accusation, threatened assembly member Ron Kim, called him and threatened to destroy his career over criticism about how Cuomo handled the nursing home debacle where thousands died and he lied. Um, For those of you on the right that are partisans, that's a cool shirt. Picture of Cuomo. Cuomo lied. Thousands died. Thousands died. Cuomo lied. Um, Anyhow, um, you know, throw throw into the mix some sexual harassment accusations. um, And he's not having himself a good month. Uh, Letitia James is going to get him. She's getting everybody. Get him, Letitia. <laughs> and yeah, I think we've talked about the nursing homes on here before. Uh, the crazy, the extent to which uh, politicians will uh, go and be two faced and say one thing and do another. Um, and yeah, we dish it out on both sides of the aisle, too. I remember talking about uh dumbass de Blasio doing things um, uh, during the COVID outbreak and us talking about it. So um, we should talk more about Letitia, though. She's going after everybody, man. She's going after uh, Amazon. She's going after uh, Cuomo. She's taking on antitrust stuff. She's trying to get Trump's tax records released. I mean, this uh, she's that, the that, New York that. Attorney General, everybody. If you don't know who she is, you should uh, just take a look into her. Let, let, let's talk Making about it. quite a name for herself. Well, she got those, she got those uh, tax records released. Those have now been court-ordered to be turned over, and I believe they were turned over earlier this week. Um, and I'll tell you this, in the words of billionaire entrepreneur Jay-Z, Men lie, women lie, numbers don't. And if there is a scandal to be had, and by scandal, I mean crimes and indictments to be had, uh, it's always follow the money, people. You know, forget, you know, whether he incited a riot, uh, whether he incited an insurrection, whether he enabled, you know, white supremacist views, whether they were there on his, for, for, forget all of that. We can agree and disagree and, and discuss it. We have at length here, but... The numbers won't lie. And it wasn't just one year of tax returns. It was several. So I am really, really, really curious to see what comes of it. Um, Again, the exposure here for Mr. Trump isn't civil exposure or an impeachment. This would be criminal exposure. And so, yeah, let's, uh, let's keep an eye on that. Interesting stuff. Bizarro world. It is a bizarro world. Do you want to talk about Uncle Joe bombing Syria? Sure, but I haven't paid too much attention. Um, all I'd say is surprise we're bombing a Middle Eastern country again under a different president. Under a different president. So again, um, you know, it's um, it's only been a month, Joe. He just got here a month and a half ago. And um Here is what he's saying. Here's what the administration is saying. Um, Joe Biden on Thursday ordered airstrikes on buildings in Syria that the Pentagon said, air quotes, (laughs) were used by Iranian-backed militias in retaliation for rocket attacks on U.S. targets in neighboring Iraq. At least 22 people have been killed. Um, That from the London-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. And so uh, Press Secretary John Kirby 
is trying to play this off, calling it proportionate and defensive. I am not an expert on Middle East policy. Sounds like we should have bought the capital last month. I was going there. You beat me to it, Mr. Hodges. Often we're, we're, we're as, as usual, we're often aligned in our thoughts. Um, look, proportional and defensive. It seemed pretty offensive and it didn't seem very proportional, especially, especially when we learn, as, as, as we now know, that Washington Post journalists that was murdered in Saudi Arabia by MBS um, isn't going to face repercussions. Now, I'll give the Biden administration some credit. For those of you, those of you not aware, there's a great documentary, by the way. You'd like this one, Nick. It's called The Dissident. It's on Apple TV. Uh, it's, 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 you can rent the movie. Uh, you can download the movie. It's a great documentary. Um, on the killing of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Um, He was killed in 2018. He was killed while updating his passport at an embassy. The CIA just released a report um, that acknowledges that the killing was approved by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the king's de facto ruler. Um, The conclusion was based, according to the report, on the prince's absolute control of decision-making, the involvement of the operation of a top advisor and seven members of his personal protective detail, and his support for using violent measures to silence dissidents abroad. Now, this was a Washington Post journalist. This was also a permanent U.S. resident. So yes, he had dual citizenship or dual residency, and, you know, for, for... for the Biden administration to say that they're not going to pursue a ban of MBS, as he's known, Mohammed bin Salman, or an asset freeze of his assets directly because it would jeopardize, and I want to get, I want to get the word, the, 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 the way that they're framing it correctly, but it would je- jeopardize a relationship with a key ally in the region. Where do we draw the line as a country if we're bombing Syria? And again, I'm not saying we shouldn't have bombed Syria. I don't know if our troops are really under attack or not. I don't know if, you know, what happened there. I'm just saying it's troubling to me that a month and a half into an administration, uh, a new administration where where we're back in the Middle East bombing away, but at the same time, we're, we're, we're giving this guy a pass for killing a U.S. resident. A Washington Post journalist. My brother works for the Washington Post. So let's say my brother was working on a story. Let's say he's in Mexico and let's say somebody chops his head off. And I look to my government for a proportionate response, as was described for what happened in Syria. And I get nothing. (laughs) Well, what's my proportionate response? And I'll just leave that there. Uh, where do we draw the line as a country? What, what, what? Who, who, who's okay to, to to kill? Who's not okay? When do we go after people? When don't we go after people? We talked about this, you know, the two systems of justice in in, in America, right? We talked about this with the insurrectionists that get to go to Mexico and get to go on work retreats and you know get to go home to mom and 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 some meatloaf after trying to sell the Russians Pelosi's laptop and the double standard that goes with that right Kyle Rittenhouse and his ability to walk free despite you know drinking underage at a bar and disappearing for a couple of days while on per, while on a on 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 release waiting trial um so look I, I I don't have answers but this is troubling to me both of those situations are troubling to me uh escalation of tensions in the Middle East again and and you know, uh, allowing MBS um, to skate free on this one. Now, the Biden administration is imposing some uh, freezes of assets and 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 revoking visas of some of MBS's close um, allies and and cabinet officials. But yeah, this is troubling to me, Nick. I don't I don't know I don't know what you think about it. I've said it before. I'm no Middle East expert, and so. I don't know why we continue to kowtow to Saudi Arabia. I understand the oil dependence of 
yesteryear, but in this day and age, um, when America can produce as much oil as it can produce, I don't um, understand the necessity for that. And we'll see if it changes with this uh, turning of generations. As far as it impacts the market, um, one, certainly not no flight to safe haven of gold in that respect. Um, and I guess even oil pulled back a tiny bit, but I guess I would say watch the oil space because um, outside of the supply and demand OPEC stuff, which I don't really follow and I'm no expert in either. I've been talking about oil for a little bit and it's certainly been inflating it. Now at a year high is over $60 a barrel uh, in case you haven't been paying attention. And so that's how I would relate it there. And um, otherwise, it's just um, par for the course, right? Which is why I try to stay uh, agnostic when it comes to, to politics, right? Because uh, a change of the year, a change of the season, a change of the administration, but uh, the same old storyline from uh, the Middle East and the, and the response from the U.S. You could have taken me back four, eight, 16, 20 years and it would have been the same story, right? And absolutely. And just to stay factual, this is what the Secretary of State and Tony Blinken said. He said, in response to the attacks on journalists or activists, they are applying a new visa restriction policy to 76 Saudi individuals believed to have been engaged in threatening dissidents overseas, including but not limited to the Khashoggi killing. Um, he did not name the crown prince in his statement. Um, yeah. Adam Schiff, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, said there's no escaping the stark truth laid bare in the CIA's long overdue public assessment. The Biden administration would need to follow this attribution of responsibility with serious repercussions against all of the responsible parties it has identified and also reassess our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, I'll be watching, but I won't be holding my breath. No doubt. What else is going on out there, Nick? You want to talk about the USPS balking at electric vehicles? <laughs> I do. I do. And I don't know what I want to talk about, but, um, well, it's a good uh, segue, actually, to a new administration um, continuing the same old and, um, you know, change being slow. So I, I think it might have been last week or even the week before we were talking about Biden's pledge to electrify so many of uh, the government vehicles, right? Uh, do you remember that? I do. And so um, there was this thing about the the Postal Service awarding a contract for a new um, postal delivery truck, you know, like the iconic USPS trucks that you see in your, your neighborhood. And I think we might have even talked about those trucks in past episodes because they were bursting into flames. Um, <laughs> Oops. Because <laughs> they are so old. All those trucks have been in, they're, so, they're like all at the end of their service life and they're costing so much. And that's why they got to replace them. And it would seem if you want to make uh, electric vehicles uh, adopted in the government, and it would seem that if electric vehicles are well suited to um, short delivery routes like, you know, mail trucks fucking go on. Um, and it would seem like if you want to lead by example and you want to usher in the future and you've already started all this chatter about uh, climate change and rejoining the Paris thing, that you would want to um, award the contract for all these new vehicles um, and get them electric. But... Um, this week, we learned that, in fact, they're not going to be electric. Um, only 10% of them are going to be electric and 90% will be gas powered. Um, and it's a lot of them. It's um, anywhere between 50,000 and 165,000 trucks uh, with an upfront payment to uh, Oshkosh, the big uh, military uh, manufacturer partner company of $500 million dollars. Um, and there was really no justification given other than uh, upfront cost uh, hmm. as to why they didn't get hmm. the electric uh, vehicles, right? And so um, I don't know really where to take the conversation from there other than a couple of things. One, uh, we saw uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had to uh, stop the importation of this. Korean bat battery supply chain components, right? 
Um, and then we saw more recently Biden order the overhaul of the, the supply chain of uh, high tech defense and, and clean tech components, including rare earths and other things. We talked about that last week. And so um, it seems like it's harder um, than a lot of people would have you believe. And this is sort of the 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 theme I try to get across when I talk about solar roads and and wave energy and things <laughs> like that. But it's and it's not that I'm opposed to it. It's when it's just when I see these big sweeping targets like we're going to be decarbonized by 2030 or we're going to be you know this or that. I think it's harder than um, you know just you know applying a broad label to that. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in there that's overlooked in this theme, and that's like why it's harder than. Themes. And that's like the supply chain. Like if you and you know where I'm going, if you want the the batteries to be American and you want the cars to be American and uh, you want to review the supply chain. Well, guess what? Like there's not that many um, resources available to to source those components from, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, rare earths or uh, antimony or whatever it is. And so. Um, I think that's what's lost in like these stories like, oh, darn, they didn't get the electric vehicles again. It's because it's harder than it's uh, than it seems of all the headlines you read about. Oh, GM's going to stop manufacturing elect- or gas cars by 2030. Right. Like it's just there's a lot b- built and baked into that. Right. It's what I'm trying to get across. And, and, and with that comes a lot of opportunity because, again, you know, quality copper deposits, quality lithium deposits, quality, you know, nickel cobalt deposits are, are, are hard to come by. They're few and far between. And, you know, and, 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 and further to that point, even when you come across one, you actually got to hit that sweet spot in the cycle where you're in a position to take advantage of higher prices and, 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 and good return on investment. And, you know, that, 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 is it's easy to miss that window at times if you happen to find a deposit and try to develop it um, during the wrong part of the cycle. We talked Mountain Pass before, and I still have my doubts that that will be a successful mine. But I tell you what, Nick Hodge subscribers um, have sure had a successful ride and have profited from the story that is Mountain Pass, right? And the SPAC that took it public. Um, what are you up on that now? What? 300 percent nick 350 you know it 30 13 to, to 40 plus in a month and a half uh, yeah i guess that's right since december yeah there you go who, who cares if it becomes a mine i mean <laughs> yeah national security implications i want it to succeed but if you just made 350 percent in the past month and a half you did good that's a win that's a sector that you know did good for you and delivered now now, now you just gotta do it again um, you know, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there. A lot of opportunity in that space. It's not as easy as just announcing that everything will be all electric. That will not make it so. Um, but again, if you're paying attention and, and you can you can handle the volatility a little bit, a lot of opportunity to make some money um, in, 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 in the metal space. Mm-hmm. So here's my last little tidbit on my end of it. And then I believe you wanted to talk NASA for a second. Um, (laughs) I mentioned the gold was down and Bitcoin was down and the major U.S. indices were down. GameStop, you know where GameStop ended up for the week? (laughs) Well, I saw that it had doubled again and then was up like, I don't know, 70% after market the other day, but I hadn't really paid attention today. So tell me. So in, in true bizarro world form, right? Uh, while everything is down and people are emailing me about the uh, the uh, the collapse in the gold price and if the gold bull market is over and what does that mean for Midas and what does that mean for whatever, 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 GameStop ended up the week and ended the week up 151 percent. Incredible, incredible. Yeah, and uh, you know, I was talking to someone else uh, this week who is into the. The Dogecoin and owns the GameStop and has the Robinhood app, and so it's it's very pervasive and it's uh, part of the zeitgeist now. And uh, meme stocks are real, as it were. Indeed, and they're not going anywhere. I know the SEC decided today um, to halt trading in fifteen companies as it is now 
using social media promotions and comments as a justification to halt trading in companies. That should scare you, retail investor or managers of your own money. Think about that for a bit. Yeah, very interesting. Did I read that Elon Musk was banned from Twitter this week? It doesn't look like it. I'm on his thing right now, but I thought I read that. Did you see that or no? They kicked him off for a day or a day and a half, and then he started trolling the SEC, the world's best millionaire troll, right? Um, billionaire, will, yeah. Yeah, though I will say uh, uh, Shamath Paliapatia, he is, he's, he's a close second right now. His, his Twitter game's strong. Um, but yeah, Elon got kicked out for for his, what they said was promotion of Dogecoin. Um, they asked him why he liked it and he said, cause he likes puppies and, and memes <laughs> <laughs> and it went up 35% or something or 40%, whatever the percentage was. Then they kicked him out and then they gave him his account back. And I think one of the first things he did was start trolling the SEC saying he really hopes that they investigate, um, his holdings in Dogecoin and, 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 and what he's doing. And so he's a fun follow. If anything, he's an interesting guy. I'll say that. Interesting. I thought the bands were permanent. Oh, that's only for some people. See, we we in America, Nick, some people can kill people and be let out on bail and other people can't even be accused of stealing a backpack without being kept for three years without, um, you know, uh, reasonable bail conditions. And then in America also, um, you can't kill a U.S. resident. Of course not, unless you're a really powerful ally, then maybe you can kill a U.S. resident. Um, and in America, you know, you, 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 of course, this is capitalism. This is the heart of capitalism. We are a capitalist society and country here. Unless the SEC decides that your stock has moved irrationally due to what they deem irresponsible promotion through social media platforms. So, you know, this is America 2021, right? That's what, that's just what we're doing. Uh, get you a lobbyist and get your money up people. Cause it's, it's, it's getting scary out there. A lot of interesting discussions going on. A lot of interesting discussions indeed. Um, you want to send us home with a positive NASA story? I hope it's a positive NASA story. To be honest, Jordo, I think it was you who put it on our little crib sheet that we used because I don't think it was me, but oh. I have to imagine I have to imagine <laughs> it was the week they, they landed the Perseverance yes, thing yes. on Mars. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I, I had a joke, a Bell Copper joke. Remember Bell Copper once upon a time? Like we were so excited about... Um, them drilling the Perseverance project and they put a hole in it and it looked like they were onto a massive, potentially massive copper porphyry system and they were vectoring in. And I haven't kept up with it. So maybe they made the discovery in fairness to Bell Copper. I quit following it six, six or seven months ago when, when you know, it took years for them to get back out there and do anything with it. But anyhow, I thought it was funny that NASA was able <laughs> to drill out Perseverance before Bell Copper. And so... <laughs> And so if you haven't seen the Perseverance rover, the footage, really, really neat. Um, you know, first HD Mars panorama. Um, that did make me smile. And I did have it on our little mini list that we put together, that we cobbled together one hour before this podcast while we do 15 other things. Um, I had it on there. I thought the footage was neat. I encourage you all to kind of Google it. Um, it's where Elon thinks we'll be here in, in not, the not too distant future as a, as a civilization. So... Um, he usually takes longer than, than, than he says he will, but he usually does things too. And he gets things done. So yeah, kudos to NASA. Well, you got the living proof on your, uh, roof and no, they never did anything in perseverance. I was following that too, because I helped him raise a bit of money and because copper or Cordoba held a bit of that project. I don't know if they still do or not. Um, but yeah, that was a big disappointment right on the edge of a big porphyry, right? Yeah, so was Cordoba. <laughs> Fuckers. <laughs> and I talked Man, about it late. 17 so. for one was the rollback. Well, here, and then here's, it drifted significantly lower after that. Here's a funny story. They have a, a market cap of $74 million. And I remember a couple of years ago, I had a nice friendly discussion as i always do with with john kaiser whose whose views i on on critical metals especially i respect and i followed his work for years and i i i, I think you know his writing is is really really well done and worth a read um and him and i were on a site visit i believe it was midas um and, and i believe you were at the site visit and back then you know the deposit looked great it's still a phenomenal deposit um the share structure was still intact the stock had pulled back a little bit and i said look I can easily justify 
a 75 to $100 million market cap once copper gets going just on the discovery they've made at Alacran alone, not to mention the rest of the district and the upside potential. The good news on that point is that I was right because the market cap today is $74 million and the stock, which at the time was like $0.70, cents, now trades at a buck thirty. The bad news is <laughs> it trades at a dollar thirty after a seventeen for one consolidation. Um, and so, you know, you get the deposit right, you get the rocks right, even though I'm not a geologist. I got the market cap valuation right. Never thought that uh the shares would get plundered the way they did and the share structure blown out uh to smithereens. And so lesson learned, one of uh one of the worst calls I've made. That one in Gainey Capital, which was an exercise in uh in uh <laughs> in frustration uh probably two of the ones that 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 i regret the most well the stress the share structure is much leaner now gerardo <laughs> same people not touching it i'll leave it there mr hodge anything else that's all i got on my end it's 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 been a week it was nice to have sunshine and see people have heat and food and most people have water we got sunshine in Austin again. It's been a week, a busy one, as as you know. Um, but that's all I got for the week. I feel pretty good going into the weekend. Um, yeah, I think we can leave it there unless you got anything else to add, sir. No, that's it. Uh, a couple of uh, bumpy days here in the market. Keep an eye on volatility. Uh, we'll discuss it next week, of course. But uh, next week will be interesting to see if some key levels hold. So uh, look forward to talking more about it. I like it. I am Gerardo Del Real along with my co-host, Mr. Nick Hodge. This was episode 106 of Bizarro World. Thanks for the therapy, everybody. See ya.